So uh, welcome everybody. We have uh, Mike Johnson, Nick Vanderbrock, Ben Holleran, and myself, Brian Stratton, talking about the, uh, the baselines of work. Uh, we're engaging on uh, a question of why do you uh, build content for yourself and what benefit does that really offer? Um, and we feel that uh, maybe another one to, uh, to bridge into is, well, what do you guys feel makes you credible as a <clears throat> subject matter expert, for example, enough to respond to what Nick said about being willing to give your opinion on a topic. This has massive applications to work. It also has applications to how you pose yourself. And I'll give a personal example as you guys ponder this. Imagine this, you're with me in Chicago, you just crossed, you know, you've come in on the train, you cross the bridge over the river, it's a beautiful day. You're super excited to work for DRW, right? This big trading firm in Chicago. And they're setting up a, a like a big exchange kind of server project and you're super excited. And you go into the meeting um, more appropriately into the Starbucks and you sit down at the table and you get to talking with the guy and you say, I'm a data center SME. Right, like I'd worked in the space for eight years, right? And it's a huge space. There's a ton to understand there. Networking, coding, physical work, project management, all sorts of stuff, global communications, multiple operation groups, like a whole myriad of stuff. And I thought I was an SME and he said, well, what does that mean to you? And he just like, I had never fully processed what I felt that was like, is it the 10,000 hours? Is it reading five books? You know, like, so there's like a personal experience for me where I really learned about what the depth of what I become as a favor, like I started with for a company, how can I become the best sale for someone and overselling and a whole bunch of things sort of play off of what we feel we are, how capable we are to make content, Nick, you know, how much of a subject matter expert are we? So what do you guys feel that SME is with that context? I would go first then. Um, so what I would say is, um, I think if you're if you're new to a, a very different situation or to a different topic, um, then it's it's definitely important to make sure that you state your opinion and that you state your opinion as truthfully as you possibly can. Meaning you uh, you articulate everything as well as you possibly can. Um, but at the same time to do it as humbly as possible. And so, for example, in the call that we had yesterday with Lucas, I was trying to give my opinion on marketing, knowing that I don't know much about marketing. I was just trying to phrase it and remind everyone, like, look, I'm aware that I don't know much about marketing, so feel free to ignore this if it's bullshit, but this is what seems like the most sensible route to me, right? And right. I feel like that's a humble enough way to phrase it that no one will, will take offense to it, and then you can see what people's reactions are. And yesterday with the marketing thing, it seemed like it was working out pretty well. It seemed like people were roughly agreeing with, with my view on, on how to do this marketing thing, which gives you then the confidence to say, okay, maybe I can, you know, maybe I don't need to remind people with every single sentence I say that I don't know anything about marketing, right? Whereas, for example, on the, on the concept of morality, I've had, you know, by now I've had like 20 conversations with 20 different people, specifically about one single question being, is there such a thing as, a, as an absolute truth in morality? Um, and, um, you know, most of the people that I've talked to uh, violently disagree with this, and I think it's absolutely true. But from those conversations, it's very clear to me that I, I can't argue it well enough yet that I should believe that my opinion is true, right? Um, as in, you know, on the one hand, you have what is your actual opinion, but on the other hand, there's also the question of how how convinced are you of this opinion, right? Like there's plenty of debates where I have an opinion about it, but I, I, I know that I don't know enough about the subject um, where I'm aware that if I learn more about the subjects, there's a decent chance my opinion will change. Um, so I think that's something that's to be taken into account, you know, like you try to throw your opinion out there and you try to be humble about it and you see what the reaction are. And if the reactions are, oh, you know, this is great. Like our environment accepts people speaking their minds and what you're saying is not completely moronic, then yeah, go for it, continue. And if you're, if, if you see the reaction that people don't appreciate you saying what you believe, 
you should probably go to a different environment. And if people um, react to it by saying, look, that's actually really wrong because of this and this and this, and you're like, oh, wait, that makes sense. Um, then you need to weigh the question of, on the one hand, you learn something. On the other hand, you wasted people's time. Um, so, so I feel like- what I, got, what I got from that, so, Mike, Ben, is that Nick really feels like an SME might be someone that you just believe. Like yeah. I don't know subject that matter and kind of like authority. They're, they're based on authority. authority the question was, is what's an SME, right? And you talked a lot about interacting with opinions getting to the point of becoming that, but more the definition of what's an SME. So Mike, Ben, what do you guys feel? Go ahead, Mike, unless I got something as well. Oh, you're muted, Mike. <laughs> Sorry, Ben, go ahead. Oh, sure. So um, I think there are multiple, that there are multiple, I think, I think this is well documented, there are different types of authority in the world um, and and different reasons why you respect somebody uh, as authority sometimes it's just because they're your friend and sometimes because they're a subject mat they're a subject expert and sometimes because they're just they're just uh, they're just wise in general they're experienced in general and like you know that they're experienced in one area so they're probably experienced in the area you're talking about but anyway um, I think some people look, some people respect different kinds of authority better. Um, and like, uh, and one of those ways of authority is just, it's not even, uh, the brain's not working, is like just the interpersonal side of things. It's not really, some people really just care that, that, you're a you're a good person that you're a that they, you know like that you like hanging around with them, and that's what gives you the credit that gives you the credibility, not necessarily that you're good at something. And I think Nick, what Nick is saying is that kind of response, that kind of authority doesn't matter to him. He really wants authority that's based on on experience. Um, I'm not sure I entirely agree with that. I think that being a good person is definitely important. However, I think that, um, I mean, it depends on what you mean by being a good person. I think part of being a good person is, let's say like this, I, I wouldn't call someone good if they're naively good. As in someone who's never done anything wrong because they've never been in a situation where they could do anything wrong isn't a good person. They're just naive, right? There's nothing, there's nothing, good, there's nothing virtuous about a rabbit is kind of the, the quote that goes with that. Um, which is one that I really like. Um, I think um, in order to be a good person, part of that is being um, being strong and competent and skilled um, and using that for good. But I think someone someone who, let's say like this, to me, good is definitely associated with the concept of being admirable, um, mm. which might might make clear what I mean by, by that. Um, so if someone comes in who's clearly good, as in someone who's wise, who's admirable, who's thought about lots of different things, but maybe doesn't know anything about the specific topic that you're talking about, um, I think they will still have the right approach of listening enough that they can figure out how to form an opinion which might actually be useful. And then I'm absolutely going to listen to them and consider, um, consider what I can make of their opinion. So are we identifying, and Mike, I want to hear what you feel next. Um, are we identifying the different attributes you guys feel of what a SME is? Just to be clear, SME stands for subject matter expert or? Yeah. These right. are the guys, for example, that if you want to build a product, you'd get them all in a room and figure out what needed to be done and, and who's going to do it. No, it's just funny because you were talking about SMEs and to me, SMEs are small and medium enterprises. <laughs> okay. So we're talking about pitching ourselves individually, um, how this relates to work and access to such, uh, doing the things we love doing, uh, a favor to people. So at an individual level. So Mike, how would you parallel with uh, what we've built here? So I'll, 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 I'll share a story first and then build on some of the other comments. This, this came to me uh, really clearly a few years ago. Yeah. In my organization at Cummins, I had a, I had a young man who was <clears throat> trying to sort out what he wanted to do in his career. 
and uh, he came to to his boss who reported to me and said, look, I've, I've been a, a business analyst for a while. This was in an IT department. I've been a business analyst for a while, but I want to be a project manager. Hmm. And so we agreed to give him the opportunity to do that. He had taken some training and, and showed some promise at it. So we, we moved him into a project management role. And he successfully completed the first project we gave him. It wasn't something tremendously complex, but it was it was complex enough that he had to he had to learn and and, and stretch a bit as he went through it. We got done with it, and we his boss was ready to assign him something else to do, and he said, "No, no, no! I've done that. Now I want to be a program manager." And uh-huh. she said, you're "Not you're not ready." And he ended up, he disagreed. He ended up coming to me to arbitrate it. And, and my response was, look, I think about this in, in sort of three tiers. Uh, and so I think about, I think about it as the lowest tier is exposure in a particular area. And that's what you've had. You've been exposed to project management, but you haven't, uh, you don't have the, you haven't gotten to the next tier, which is really experience, having done that thing or worked in that field enough to have uh, seen a lot of the variations or to see the different kind of issues that come up. I said you ran a you ran a happy path project that really didn't have any problems, but you haven't experienced what happens when your major sponsor or stakeholder. Uh, changes their mind about things in the middle of the project or you lose your funding or some key resource quits on you, right? So all you've got is exposure to this domain. You don't have experience. And and the third tier after experience, I think of as mastery, which is you've done this now over and over for years and, uh, you know, have, have been there, done that, seen the things, failed enough to understand what your limits are and and now can consider yourself to be a subject matter expert and if i tie that into kind of what i heard nick and and ben talk about the 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 part of it the the other two things i think about it are first if you're if you're going to say you're a subject matter expert you need to be clear about uh the boundaries of your knowledge and the, and the breadth and depth, uh, you know, you, you may have heard the saying, my knowledge is a mile wide and an inch deep. You know, some people, mm, yeah. some people are like that. Other people, <laughs> you know, they, they've, got, they've got real depth in a, in a particular, in a particular area. And so I'll, I'll piggyback Brian off, off your comment about mm-hmm. in data centers. I worked in it for 30, 35 years and there are there are aspects of it that I know a little bit about data center operations being one of those right I've worked in a data center but it was a long time ago I've been a developer but that was a long time ago what I have done the most of is manage people and projects and programs and budgets so my expertise is in that in that management slice in the IT world I could not present myself as an expert or a subject, a subject matter expert, say in, in data center operations or in development anymore, because that's not where I've, I've had my focus. So my area of mastery is, is in that, is in that kind of narrow band. Uh, I can comment on those other things kind of to, to, to Nick's point, but I would do it with that same sort of humility, and with the attitude of saying, you know, uh, I'm going to offer this opinion. I know the limits of my knowledge in here, and I appreciate the feedback that somebody might give me. And I'm open to learning more about the topic from the other people in the conversation who maybe know more. That makes sense. I'm finishing taking notes here. Ben, Nick, what do you want to, what questions do you have? Hmm. Ben, do you have any comments? No, I'm. I that makes sense to me. So um, I really so, like that. So the, the only ahead, thing ben. that I would, 
The only thing that I would add to that is one more thing, which is, so I absolutely agree with everything that you said, um, except that there's one more thing, which is there is the concept of transferable skills. And some skills are just so massively transferable that the people who properly mastered them, and again, you know, mastering those takes easily 10, 20 years, but the people who mastered them can really add a useful opinion to situations that they don't know much of the details of, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, there's plenty of people who know a ton about um, human psychology and they know a ton about how to actually properly listen and speak, um, but they've never done anything related to marketing before. Well, those people are gonna have a hell of a lot more useful things to say about marketing than people who don't have those transferable skills. So that's the only thing that I would add to that, which is, um, it, I mean, there's, you can be an SME in the sense of you're an expert on that topic, but there's also such a thing as people who are an expert on certain transferable skills, where obviously the, the highest form of transferable skills is something like being an expert in life, right? Um, <laughs> and, and I think that's also something that's important to take into account. Like I've, I've definitely been in conversations where I would have said, look, there's, there's some famous people that I can point at where if they would have come into the conversation, they would have definitely been able to say a hell of a lot more useful things than I did, even though the subject, like even though I have more experience with the subject matter, just because they're so fantastically good at, um, you know, listening to people and figuring out exactly what they mean and then looking into human psychology and what actually works and what doesn't work with people and all of that stuff, right? And Mike? I'm, I'm distracted again. So I'm going to parallel with that and say that the clear on boundaries is excellent, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. I was taking some notes here. Um, enough failure. That's um, We've talked about a, a theory of this idea of truth enough, right? For example, imagine you're just like in a big valley and surrounded, you know, you're surrounded by mountains everywhere right? They're big and massive. And each one is a networking mountain, right? This is the mountain of all networking knowledge. And this is the mountain of all Linux knowledge and, you know, so on and so forth down the chain, right? As a technologist, I'm being a little biased here, but like, this is the pro forma mountain, right? For the financial guys and they, you know, so, so on and so forth. Um, yeah. My question to myself, walking out of a data center one day after 36 hours straight work, uh, just like, I'm never going to get burned out. Like, you know, putting my fist at the sky, like, uh, that was awesome, you know, or just terrible work, but, you know, like workload, but awesome is that, well, how far up that mountain can I really go, you know, and where is that expectation set for me, and where is it for others, right, and if I'm confused on this, and yet thinking so deeply about it, how confused are other people that have never even engaged on this topic, right, and what are their expectations, and what is the authority <laughs> and the other attributes that apply to a subject matter expert, right? What is it, um, is it primarily just skill-based, right? I'm assuming yes. What do you guys feel about that? Well, my dad told me that if you wanna be the, the specialist, if you wanna be the, the expert in the world on something, all you have to do is specialize deep enough. And like, it's, it's easy to be the, the expert of something like everybody's their world expert in their own backyards and so it depends on what you're trying to do <laughs> that's a great phrase everybody's the world expert on their backyard <laughs> you know and so then what they do find you want to make your backyard in life right right exactly oh that's a good yeah. point yeah yeah and so like some people like you know some people specialize in the trouble is when you specialize in something that isn't useful to the world like oh, I don't know an anime <laughs> the world expert in anime but you don't actually write anime you just consume it so now <laughs> I don't know that's not a that's not doesn't seem like a very useful skill monetary wise that's but anyway. a that's a much bigger conversation as far as yeah, what exactly. is subjectively useful. We won't engage on that no, one. I and for anybody watching it. this, it's more that um, I feel, and I know Ben and Nick agree, and Mike, let me know how you feel about this, that each person must determine 
what is this backyard for them, right? And even before that, you know, you have to even conceptualize this. So this is like accepting what is valuable to you in your life, right? What is subjectively valuable. And then you spend your life working on that. And I actually, I wouldn't, there's a philosopher called Thomas Collet and he talks about the looking glass, right? And so I wouldn't encourage anyone to pursue a life, even coming back to our original question of why do we produce content, to pursue a life of trying to be useful to others, right? Mm. I think that you personally, if you want to talk back, you know, respond to my idea of how can I be the best favor for others? How can a person sell themselves every day and stay true to the person in the mirror? All those things, right? We talked about morality a little bit as well. Um, big topics for maybe another day. But how can we, how can we not necessarily need to be useful, right? How can we already know that we're just, we're just channeling with everybody else. Artists and musicians call it that. And so we're not just channeling with the people we might think of, like, do I, am I, am I truth enough for them? Am I subject matter expert enough for them? Because what happens, Nick, is you said to me, I'm going to be the head of engineering for a company, right? And everybody's sort of on the same level. So I'm SME enough for the room, right? Mm -hmm. I'm truth mm -hmm. enough for the room. And now, Mike, you'd walk into a room at Cummins, and I'm assuming with what you shared with us, you would feel truth enough or SME enough to walk into your realm, right? Which probably has people of a similar level of mastery, as you talked about right, in, in those, those shared rooms and the people you worked with as equals in your organization, maybe as a good example. Um, so I feel like something to be noted here at the end of my shtick, uh, shtick here is um, that I think SME is like, imagine that mountain again, and you've chosen to, like Nick talked about at the beginning, you've chosen to climb spiritual mountain, like studying Judaism and everything, like Taoism and, and everything under the sun. In certain rooms or different places in your life with people, this high up the mountain is fine, right? But then the next level would be acceptable for maybe you might think a professional, which is again determined, right? You're setting up even the view of how you look at the your backyard, right? Your ex what the thing you're an expert on, right? So what is truth enough for each of these environments is something that I feel defines what an SME is. I'll, I'll go back to your kind of the question that started this, which is, is, is being an SME skill-based. And I think that's a, I think that's a big part of it. I also think there's an experience component to it as well, because I can have, I can achieve, I can learn a skill, but until I've, until I've practiced it and had experience executing that skill, um, it's, it's maybe academic knowledge or, or imma an immature level of that skill. Okay. So I think that's a, I think that's a component of it. I think your, I think your metaphor about mountains, is is interesting for a couple reasons, and the thing I the thing I got to thinking about was first, um, why why do we set out to be SMEs at all versus generalists? So right, that's a good question. In, in that valley, in between all of those mountains, perhaps I only want to go up. You know, we'll say the finance mountain. I want to go up that mountain a little ways. To sort of understand what it's about but I don't care about getting to the summit and maybe I want to go up the psychology mountain a little bit to understand a bit more about how people think or why I think the way I do I don't need to be uh, a, a PhD in that space uh, so I, I think there are I think there are probably people whose whose curiosity and perhaps attention span uh, curiosity is so great and attention span might be much lower that they will, they may never achieve subject matter expertise in a particular field, but they'll have this broad experience uh, and space of knowledge that, that is in a lot of ways equally valuable in, in a collaborative uh, 
group setting. The other, the other part of the mountain thing, and I, I could reach behind me and grab this book, but right at the beginning of the year, I read a book called The Second Mountain. Oh. By David Brooks. He's a, he's a columnist for the New York Times. Uh, it's a book that was given to me by a friend of mine. It's not a book I would have ever picked off the shelf and bought, but I found it fascinating. And, and Brooks's thesis is that uh, we go through our lives, uh, he calls it the first mountain. You, you go up the first mountain for a period of time in your life, and climbing that mountain is about uh, achieving in your field and uh, you know, gaining material wealth and, and all of the sort of things that you associate with striving in your career, you know, having a family, having a happy life, right? All of those sort of things are, are, are there. But uh, lots of people sort of get to the pinnacle of that mountain and realize that there's more to life. They're unfulfilled by that. And so uh, many people will move on to the second mountain, which is uh, a life of, of service to higher causes or to other people. And you, you know, there are, there are lots of illustrations of that and the, and the things that motivate people or prompt them to do that are, are very, very different. You know, the, the death of a loved one can, can prompt someone to sort of rethink the trajectory of their life and go, I, I, you know, I've been, uh, I've been focused on me and, and my things for so long. Now I want to focus on, on others. It could be the, the experience of, of injustice, injustice or intolerance or uh, a physical disaster. Uh, you know, there are lots of stories of, you, you hear of, of people who joined the, the U.S. military after 9-11 because they felt a higher calling to, to go do something. So anyway, that's just, in using the mountain metaphor, uh, I found Brooks's, Brooks's book to be uh, really interesting and insightful. That's really great. What do you guys feel about that? I have some stuff I definitely want to parallel. Yeah, that was awesome. I, I, exactly. The, the, uh, the idea of, of people understanding that the, that the real goal in life is service and helping others. I think that, well, I'd like to think that more people would, would get to that point quicker if they were themselves taken care of. Uh, that goes into Plato society. So I don't know. If, well, and into Maslow as well, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I think we've come to a really appropriate one to start really summarizing and having it clear in our minds what we've sort of learned and sort of laid out here and how we can talk about things in the future is why do you want to be? that question of why do you want to be right like why does your backyard the thing that everyone's a world expert in i love that ben um why does your backyard have to be any specific thing right is there a requirement for saying knowledge and what are the things that determine that if there is I think these are fascinating takeaways and how far up the mountain, right? Does somebody need to go to become a subject matter expert? I think parallels with all of them. Half of me says it's your perception of truth enough. And the other half of me says it's the environmental needs. Mm. Yeah. Um, something that I wanted to yeah, add perfect. is, um, um, Mike, you talked about these, these two mountains. I mean, you talked about them in life as well, where I absolutely, like, I mean, obviously I'm too young to, to, uh, to really be aware of the existence of a second mountain. Um, but from everything that I've seen, that seems like it's, it's very compatible with, with life. And we've talked about that before, and, and, and it seemed like a very sensible thing to say to me, right? Um, what I did want to say is, I think in terms of um, one of the things that I've noticed in terms of, let's say, professional aptitude, 
um, is that I feel like there's more than two mountains. I think there's three mountains. And the first one is academic, right? It's like I'm going to learn a skill and then pretend like I know the skill, even though I've never actually used it. Um, yeah. And then the second part is now I'm actually going to go do it and get experience with it. Um, but I think there's a third one, which is, um, okay, you can have a skill, but you also need to figure out how to integrate that skill in a company. So for example, one of the, I think one of the best examples that I have of that is um, with, my, with my last, you know, like general, genuine job is working as a more or less uh, employee. Um, I, um, I, did, um, I did a bunch of interviews as an interviewer um, and a bunch of people passed by who clearly had enough academic knowledge to get the job and who clearly had enough experience to get the job, right? So they knew how to code. They, they, so these were for intern positions at the company where I was working. So they were, would be working as a software developer and they clearly had enough experience with that, except that there were problems. Like for example, one of the guys, so one of the problems I had was this, the, the interviews were split up in two parts and one of them was a technical part, right? So we basically asked them to implement, um, well, Anyway, so they needed to do some technical stuff. Now, the specific technical question that I asked them is the same question that I got when I was interviewed to enter the company. And it's the same question that I had asked 10 other interviewees, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously I knew what I was talking about. I had thought very carefully about this problem and how to solve it and all of the different ways to solve it. So anyway, I asked this guy to solve it and he starts doing it. And I see that he's taking a wrong path, right? I see that he's over engineering. He's going for a very complicated solution. And I know we only have 25 minutes. No way he's ever going to get this done. So I tried to give him some hints and his reaction is basically, no, I'm going to ignore that and just do my own thing. Right. And, and that's, that to me is a clear sign that there's something wrong with him which is, has nothing to do with academic knowledge or experience. Like, I'm sure he's a good programmer, but he can't work in a team, um, mm. right? So there's some, some things other than only, let's say like this, you can be, you can have all the academic knowledge and the experience on a specific skill, but I think any specific skill is useless if it's not embedded in at least some level of experience and knowledge about a bunch of different skills. Like, I mean, obviously teamwork is one of the most obvious ones, you can have, you know, management skills might be important if you want to be a very, very good coder. So there's like a bunch of other skills, which you also need to some extent. So I guess what I'm saying is everything that we do in the end, we can try and isolate it to study it separately. But in the end, it's still embedded in the real world. Um, and, um, you know, so any particular skill still interacts with other people and still interacts with the real world. And you need to make sure that those interactions work properly as well as well. So things like, you know, I can take feedback, I can communicate my ideas properly and that kind of stuff are, are also very important. Um, so that's just something that I wanted to mention. I think you've yeah, illustrated. Many, Go ahead. How many of us have met the, uh, the, the, the grumpy coder that works alone in the back room and can't get along with anybody? Or yes, the, but probably. produces exquisite work. Yeah. Yeah, the grumpy mechanic or whoever, right? So, yeah. I the, well, I mean, let's say like this. I think there's very few jobs where you can do that. And I think people think right. that there's a lot more jobs where you can do that than you can. To give you an example, um, so I just joined this new company as the head of engineering. Um, and through one of the first conversations that I had with the CEO, he mentioned that there's another guy who's kind of involved with the company, um, who is a guy like this, except not a programmer, he's a mathematician. Um, but he's also someone that can't properly articulate his ideas. When he talks to the CEO, the CEO doesn't actually understand what his ideas are. He's very, very stubborn in what he's talking about. He doesn't want to talk about the real life situations, but more, you know. And basically what the CEO told me is, you're a mathematician, you go have a conversation with him and you figure out whether he's at all useful, right? So I don't know, I haven't had the conversation yet, so I don't know whether it's going to be useful or not, but I'd say there's a 50% chance that I'm going to have to report back and say, look, this is a really clever guy. He really knows what he's talking about in terms of math, in terms of academic knowledge and experience. But he's completely useless because he doesn't want to, you know, like he doesn't want to comply in anything. And I've met enough people like that, right? So for example, one of the problems with him is he keeps like, apparently he's a big fan of the, of the, the programming language C. Um, and he keeps talking about the fact that the performance there is going to be better and he's right. Like it's a great language and the performance is going to be better, except we're talking about a FinTech application where performance is one thing and it's important, 
But I mean, let's be honest, you're, you're, once you launch, you're going to make enough money anyway that you can just buy more servers and performance won't be that big of a problem. Right. It's just the cost. What is much more important than that is safety and security, because if you make one mistake, you could lose a billion dollars. Right? Um, I, get, I got you, buddy. I understand. I worked for high frequency trading and uh, I will let you know that if you're going to go do the lead of engineering, you cannot just throw more servers at a lot of problems. Well, I mean, fair enough. But what I mean is you, you need to see things in a certain context. And he seems to miss that and say, look, C is the most performant language that exists. So everything needs to be built in C. And that's just not true. Um, there's, there's tons of different things that you need to take into account. And I think here, one of the most important things that to take into account is uh, safety and security. Because again, you know, making a mistake in terms of performance could cost you a lot of money, but there is no such thing as making a mistake in safety and security. If you make a mistake in safety and security as a fintech startup, you're done, you're dead, that's it, right? There's nothing that you can do. If someone loses 50 bucks in the first year, because you made a mistake in your, in your code, you're done. They will sue you and you lose your reputation and it's just, it's finished, right? Um, and I mean, that not to mention the fact that the CEO is convinced that we should build all of this in Haskell. And well, I mean, if you're working for a CEO who's convinced that you should do everything in Haskell, you need to either just comply or find a very, very good argumentation for it. And not just say, but my language is more performant, right? So, so I guess that's I what I mean. Like, so Nick, so I have it clear in my mind, what is, um, with what Ben and Mike and myself are, you know, what we're building here, what do you feel as though you're paralleling here just for a summary? Uh, I mean, the thing I was commenting on was um, the, like, the, the fact that, and I think it's, it's actually a bit more general than we talked about. I think there's lots of things in life, not just, not just how you progress through life where there's two mountains. I think there's many, many things where you progress through two mountains. Morality is also a fantastic example, right? Like first you, you obey a bunch of rules that people put on you and they say, you know, don't, don't murder, don't steal, respect your parents, blah, 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 right? You have something like this, the Ten Commandments in Christianity. And it's only once you master them that you go to the second mountain of saying, now I'm, I'm not just not going to do evil, but I'm start, gonna try and start doing good. Um, so I feel like there's many places where there's two mountains, but I think in terms of professional experience, um, it's, it's important to state that there's a third one, which is whatever skill that you have, you always need to embed it into whatever is around it. Hmm. You bring up a fascinating thought. Mike, Ben, what do you guys think about this? Maybe the perspective of the backyard, the thing that everyone's an expert in, should really be what is the definition of good for you versus being useful for others? As in uh, the, the verses, were you saying um, that that were that that's the question that everyone should answer? It, it, uh, the definition of good versus helpful. Everybody needs to find their own version of good versus helpful, or that that uh, everybody needs to find their own version of good, as opposed to the importance being helpful. Let's say you're a guy that's dating. Imagine, uh -huh. that, right? Don't, don't there. Okay. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Imagine that, right? You're dating it. Uh, you're about to meet your wife, Mike, and my mind, and Ben yours, and Nick, you're you're a free roamer right now, so you can view it differently. But so she is this woman is about to find you useful, right? Interesting. Um, but really in the sense of even if it's got a romantic wrapper on it, right? We're talking about compatibility and usefulness and other things mm. along those lines. How are you gonna help me propel my life? How are you gonna support me? A number of things along those lines. And so I would encourage people, I feel, to really determine in your life how you can enjoy it. How you can, how, how what you find contentment from can become part of your backyard and where you just are channeling with the rest of the world producing or diffusing this design, you wanna see this good that you might be determining. So I feel like determining what good is for someone is almost a natural first step, like connecting with who you are versus 
being able to then connect with something in the external world, right? And so internally, acknowledging yourself as a subject matter expert, I've noted throughout our conversation is the first part of the battle, right? Have I made it far enough up the mountain to put my neck out there? What are the risks of the things? You know, the brain's processing all of that, the whole environment, you're aware of it, whatever that is. You know, I'm, I'm sure you guys can imagine at least one situation where that came to mind, where am I gonna say something? You know, is it worth it? But even with our wives, right? Is this worth a battle right now? Mm. Um, am I authoritative or subject matter expert enough to quash this or, or whatever, or enhance it or whatever the case is? So we make that bridge then from I'm good, I'm solid, Mike called it mastery, and I've seen it, I've been through the failure. It's almost like second nature, like what our conversation was previously in the week, Mike. That's truth enough. It's truth enough for you. You're, you're good, you're, you're proud of who you are, right? And then you're willing to put your deck out, right? That's what I feel like the process is. It's, it's interesting, you know, the, the old saying, uh, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think subject matter expert is a label we might, we might apply to ourselves and promote ourselves as such, but it's, it's really a label that other people need to apply to us. And you know, the, the Nick's, Nick's example there of the, the mathematician who, who probably is a subject matter expert in his particular area. He's achieved a level of mastery in that area, but he, he, hasn't, he hasn't got the ability to, as Nick said, integrate with other people. Uh, you know, he's, he's, op he's going to optimize for his particular narrow view of the world to the exclusion of others. So, in, in that regard, uh, he's going to have a difficult time being accepted as a subject matter expert by other folks because, mm. because of, uh, you know, his, his narrow, narrow focus on one particular area. And I, mm. I think that might be because uh, it's no good if you, are the, if you are a Wikipedia server and you have the information of the world if you can't communicate it to others. Yeah. <laughs> And ben, if you're not really I love to... how you just compress stuff down into <laughs> metaphors. Ben, that, you just like do that all day. That, That's great. That, <laughs> that I think is my subject matter that I'm good at. Dude, Ben it has the gift of gab, Mike. I do. But I definitely it's, it's do. Awesome. <laughs> Nick, sorry, I do apologize. Go ahead. Yeah, so I think I mean the, just to be clear, I think there's two aspects to this integration thing, which is on the one hand there's communication, but on the other hand, there's also being willing to comply with things, right? Like for right. example, um, on the one hand, this guy is coming up with new algorithms, which he believes are better than the current one, and then he needs to go ahead and be able to explain them well enough that he can convince us that he that the new algorithms are better, so we should actually implement them. But on the other hand, there's also the problem that if he sticks to his gut, sticks to his guns and says, no, I will not budge on the whole programming language thing, he's useless. Like there's nothing that he can do for a company which is building everything in Haskell if he does not want to agree with the fact that in the end his algorithms would be implemented in Haskell and not in C, right? Um, so there's multiple aspects to that, yes. And by the way, I do think that it's a good idea to to define an SME um, by saying an SME is someone who is considered an SME by other people, not by himself, um, especially now that we have a millennial generation. Um, but um, um, so, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And I think that that also immediately implies um, that you have the, uh, that you have that integration system, right? As in so looking, no one will look at this guy and say, he's a fan, like he's, like you can, you can say theoretically he's an SME, but when he's actually in a, in a conversation, in a meeting, no one is going to react to him as if he's an SME um, because he's useless in that conversation because he doesn't want to budge on some very fundamental things. Um, so closing out the hour here, because we're on the time, Nick, why don't you go first? Um, what are the things that you would have our listeners really take away from this? I just want 
less than 30 seconds from everybody. How's that? I don't know whether I can make less than 30 seconds, but I'll give it a try. So I think some of the important things are, first of all, I think an SME, what I think how you measure whether someone's an SME or not is by looking at the reactions that he generates among other people. Meaning it's not what he thinks. It's, it's also not what other people think. It's how other people act. I think that's the most important thing to look at. So that's one. A second thing that I wanted to say is I think an SME is a combination of three things, which is academic understanding of the subject, uh, expertise, and um, thirdly, also actually being able to integrate that skill with whatever is necessary so that you can turn it into something that's genuinely useful. Um, I think those are the two most important takeaways for me nice. or the things that I said. Nice, Nick. You nailed it, dude. Uh, ben, Nick, or yeah. Ben, Mike, what do you guys, uh, go ahead, Ben. Uh, sure, I got it. So um, so I think we've been talking about the SMEs and Mike brought this up earlier, but I, I think uh, there's two, there is two valid options. You can, you can climb the mountain and be the SME or you can be the generalist. Um, but the value of a generalist uh, is in, is in people coordination. So if you're not in a, if, if, if that, if you don't like, if you don't like managing people and, and figuring out how to integrate different things together, then it makes much more sense to focus on, on one thing and, and make your, uh, improve your usefulness through microman, through, uh, through specialization instead of through generalization. That's a really deep insight that if you don't want to manage people, you should become a specialist. That's a fantastic thing to say. That's a great takeaway. And Mike? Um, Well, I think the, I might go back to kind of, kind of where we started, but uh, I think the, the, one of the key takeaways from us, from this discussion uh, is the, the notion of, of being clear on your boundaries and the, the limits of your knowledge and, okay. and, and, and at the same time being, being open to learning from others around you that have different, different sets of knowledge. And I think that, that ties to the, the whole conversation about how do you integrate, how do you fit in with, with others? It's, it's that it's having an understanding that, yeah, my knowledge stops at a particular point and I value the knowledge that somebody else brings to the table and, and in, in collaboration, we're going to get to a better outcome. Yeah, that's a really, uh, that's a really great thing. I, I really have genuinely enjoyed this and I hope anybody else that's listening to it or whatnot definitely has. A, I love the note from Mike and everybody else on honesty. Um, I mm. really feel as though people want to, you know, really be happy in life or content or whatever your word of choice is, the semantics, I'm agnostic to that. But what is that thing that allows you to be happy enough with what you know to give your opinions and feel confident? Um, how can you serve your clients better? How can you, you know, if you're looking for a job, which a lot of people are in, you know, the current environment right now, how can you really acknowledge the things that you've spent enough time and you deserve a truth enough kind of moment? to say, hey, you know, I can actually go out, I feel, and make some lives better with the things that I've learned, whether that's on a wonderful, like, example spectrum that Ben's laid out for us of helping manage and coordinate or getting in with your skills. So I'm just really excited for people to be able to think that they can give back or, or give skills or give opinions. And whether you're an expert or not is I feel maybe it's just usefulness, right? So I really like the distinctions we've made here, guys. This has been a great conversation. I really appreciate everybody's time. Um, Thank you. Just genuinely. It's been awesome. Yeah, it's been awesome. So let me um, shut the recording off here and